<laughs> okay, um, I'm Sarah Davis. I am an associate professor at the Voinovich School of Leadership and Public Affairs. I work with the Environmental Studies Program. And um, I, um, my background is in environmental biology and ecology. And uh, so there are a lot of opportunities in that field to engage students in experiential learning through taking walks through the forest to experience ecosystem dynamics. Um, and, but we also have tremendous uh, resources on campus for um, conducting field research. We have something called the Land Lab, which is a tremendous resource um, that's just a short walk from the, our campus on the ridges. Um, it provides opportunities to set up um, experimental plots, and we have some bioenergy grasses growing up there. We've also built an, uh, a pilot anaerobic digestion system at the composting facility. And those are designed to be really uh, hands-on learning environments for students to conduct their own research. Um, but I'm also uh, interested in experiential learning more broadly on campus, uh, looking at uh, opportunities for people to actually engage in interdisciplinary conversation. Um, to engage across departments as well as students engaging with faculty and staff on campus and with people in the community. So um, I think we have a real opportunity to, um, to develop more experiential opportunities in our campus cult culture and to really tackle some of the major challenges that we're facing as the world changes. So um, that's sort of my area of areas of interest and experience for Okay, can everyone hear me all right? All right, my name is Nancy Stevens, and I'm a professor in the Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine. And um, I'm an anthropologist by training. So my research focuses on field experiences, which are by their nature experiential learning opportunities. Um, these are conducted um, both locally and on the international stage. And um, I've seen and witnessed firsthand the ability of people to connect ideas, skills, and solution making um, by working together and having real world experiences. <coughs> now, my work at the Heritage College has, um, in the past couple of decades, focused on problem based and experiential learning in medical education. And so for about 15 years, I led a problem-based learning curriculum where we connected medical students with opportunities for clinical reasoning um, and critical thinking skills um, from day one of medical school, recognizing, again, putting on my anthropologist hat, that um, throughout the course of human history, people have learned best by interacting and doing, by having conversations that are relevant in the moment with the experience rather than sitting and listening to someone talk right now, like you're listening to me. So um, the, the true um, engagement of students, both in our professional schools, in our research environments, and in our classrooms is something I'm really passionate about. Um, I remember having an experience when I was in high school. One of my teachers had a sign on the wall that kind of tongue-in-cheek said, um, knowledge dispensed here, bring empty containers. And he, he did that, you know, as a joke because everyone brings, brings into the classroom, not an empty container, but a whole wealth of experiences. And if there's just one person standing here talking at you the entire time, you don't get a chance to leverage all of those pieces of knowledge and all of those vast experiences that can often come together and create a much more robust solution to whatever problem you're considering. And so um, one of the things that I've become passionate about is um, better finding a sense of place and connecting with all of the different types of experiences that exist um, both across our campuses and across our communities throughout Ohio. And so um, I've been fortunate to sort of begin a process of co-curating knowledge with community stakeholders, with students, and with faculty across our campuses and thinking about how we can essentially leverage our wonderful and very distinctive environment as a place of learning for real world learning opportunities. And I think I'll stop there. Use this one here, yeah. yeah.
Good morning. I'm Amy Edmondson, Associate Professor and Graduate Director at the Journalism School. And I created a class called the Media and the Civil Rights Movement. It's a special topics course that um, really came out of another class that I teach called the History of American Journalism. How can we practice our craft and practice it well if we don't know our history? And so with that, I decided to take a section of the history class, the Civil Rights Movement, and um, do a breakout. And so we, we put students on a bus that is as much like a greyhound as I could get, um, mirroring the uh, Freedom Riders from the early 1960s, a group of idealistic college students, both black and white, many from Ohio, many trained in Ohio, to hop on buses um, and sit together testing the desegregation orders of the US Supreme Court on interstate travel. And so this is a spring break trip that's hooked to the class where we meet for the first half of the semester and do a lot of reading, a lot of documentary viewing to get ready um, for the trip. And so we go to Birmingham and we end up at 16th Street Baptist Church on a Sunday morning um, for services. And we go to Montgomery to the Equal Justice Initiative and the Southern Poverty Law Center. And we look at things that would be particularly interesting to students today, trying to hook them into modern time. For example, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center's work on monitoring hate groups is particularly powerful right now, as well as the work on lynching sites that the Equal Justice Initiative is doing. Then we go to um, Philadelphia, Mississippi, by way of Selma, cross over the Edmund Pettus Bridge together with local civil rights leaders. And um, then we also in um, um, Neshoba County, Philadelphia, Mississippi, we stand on the side of the road where the three civil rights workers from Freedom Summer 1964 were murdered and hear the story in detail from some uh, local civil rights leaders there. Then we um, go to the Emmett Till site where he was thrown into the Tallahatchie River as well as to Sumner, Mississippi, to the courthouse where um, the two men were found not guilty of, of killing Emmett Till in 1955 by an all-white jury. Then we end up in Memphis at the Lorraine Motel, which of course is the National Civil Rights Museum, and of course the site where King was assassinated. Um, so it's a really emotional time, but we, we use the time on the bus as a time to um, talk to each other, make sure everybody's okay, um, do a lot of reflecting, journaling, and so forth. It's a, it's a quick spring break trip, and if you are interested in a website, we've got OUCivilRide.com with lots of stories and videos and images from our students. Jerry Miller, professor in the School of Communication Studies and associate director for undergraduate studies in that program. I uh, take um, kind of a place-based perspective on my instruction. <clears throat> and while um, I certainly encourage students to take advantage of uh, travel away opportunities for short periods of time, many of our students cannot. And so one of the approaches I use is the place-based uh, um, uh, instructional uh, process that can occur in the classroom. And there are three, um, there are a couple of different uh, kind of triangle uh, types of, of uh, thoughts I'd like to present you with. And that is, I think it's important for our students to understand their sense of self in place, how they influence place and how the place influences them. How that particular place and they are influenced both on the local and regional and how they can influence the local and regional and then the global. And so it's very much taking from um, our understanding of political discourse and public discourse a sense of self in a place. Um, within the place-based literature, there's a, a triangle of three particular perspectives that one needs to recognize and that each place is influenced by ecology, by economy, and by culture. And so when you start to put these things together, you gain a better understanding and provide an opportunity for students to, to recognize how we talk about this place, at least in my particular discipline, and how we're influenced by those places, both as individuals uh, through the culture, as well as the ecology, economy, and, um, and the history associated with that. I have a particular class that I teach on a regular basis, both online and in person, and it's political rhetoric. And I encourage my students to really embrace the place where they grew up and identify who their political leaders are, 
what are the, what's the history of that particular place? How has, the, how has the culture or the cultures emerged over a period of time? And then throughout the term, they are assigned a hypothetical candidate who's running for political office in that particular place. And in the speeches that they write for that hypothetical candidate, they're required to really invoke um, particular issues that are relevant to that particular place. Uh, whether it is education, whether it is fracking, it might be the criminal justice system at a particular point in time. But my hope is that through these particular exercises, when they move from this place, and Dr. Titsworth has really kind of, kind of encouraged us to think about our place here, they'll take with them those same skills and recognize they're not just a new resident in a new place. That place has history, that place has significance, as they do as well, and it is a dynamic process in which they can really enhance their own citizenship and become an involved citizen in their particular community. And so with uh, um, the recognition of the pedagogy of place, which is something where I kind of came into over the past four years, um, even though I've been doing it for uh, some time before that, I now have a vocabulary that I can atta attach it to. I think it is something that uh, we can celebrate in our classrooms regardless of the discipline. Good morning, um, my name is Purva Das and I'm an Associate Professor of Communication <coughs> Studies at the Southern Campus. And I am here to talk about the COI initiative which has been um, popular among the RHE faculty for three years now. Um, so um, I hope I make sense because it's a little too early for me. Um, <laughs> I came all the way from Columbus. Um, so uh, what is COIL? COIL is Collaborative Online International Learning, um, an idea of uh, using technology uh, to collaboratively work with students uh, in different um, uh, you know, international institutions. It started in SUNY several years ago and then it spread all across the U.S. in different universities. Uh, three, four years ago, REG, a group of REG faculty got the Conical Grant and they started um, using this technology-based uh, international learning um, among the RH uh, faculty. Now, technology is the key word. As faculty, we were very skeptical because technology is wonderful if it works or if you know how to uh, you know, make it work. So that's where the instructional technology folks uh, at OU came into play. They trained us how to, even simply using Blackboard, that we didn't know that what Blackboard could do. And um, then, what, uh, then we sought out international partners and different university uh, professors who would be interested in collaborating in our, with us, uh, with our students in our classrooms. For example, right now um, in my comms 4100, which is cross-cultural communication, um, students from University of Manitoba in Colombia are working, have joined the classroom. They don't work the entire semester with our students, but they work on one or two module um, during any time of the semester. And they, the assignments that are cre actually co-created co by us, meaning OU faculty and the faculty of the international institution, prior to the start of the semester, we sit together, sit together via uh, Skype or Zoom and we co-design this uh, part of the syllabus where our students are going to collaboratively work on any issue that is pertinent for both us and for them. For example, our students, um, OU students and um, Columbia students are working on um, identity formations, how different identity is developed in different geographical locations, what it means to be uh, American and Colombian. So it breaks the preconceived notions of um, what we think an American should be or a Colombian should be. Um, and students actually interactively work through various technology means like Zoom, Skype, Google Documents, um, VoiceThread, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, to co-create, um, and there is an outcome, um, because we want our students to take that with them. Um, and we, as instructors in two locations, uh, act as guides during that four to eight weeks, whatever we decide, how many weeks are we are going to coil. Um, 
And um, we have been doing that for three years. There are cur currently 14 to 15 faculty in various disciplines across mm -hmm. RHE, from biology to physics to um, business, um, law enforcement. Um, and we get reviewed every year. Um, the folks from SUNY comes to review us. And one of the things that we had uh, asked for during our review is we need more instructional uh, or institutional support for this COIL program to be successful because faculty <coughs> need the support to be taught how to use the technology um, and uh, actually also connect us with international partners. Um, and from this year, uh, it is the COIL program is housed under Global Office and uh, the next phase would be um, coming from the global office, the directions and the strategies to take it to the next level and spread it to all um, OU faculty across the campus. Okay. And Perva, you have a workshop all about oil. Yes, today, yes, and one of them. Yeah. Okay, well, wonderful. wonderful. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, I'd love to just ask to get us warmed up if you could share how you personally define experiential learning and what makes it important today? Why is this a salient issue for our classrooms at our institution? I mean, um, you know, I, I can say from the RHE point of view, I know we are moving towards um, one Ohio, but um, I've seen a difference in, you know, what. For example, if you're talking about different cultures and uh, you know how you, you should communicate with people from different um, um, groups and backgrounds, there is a theoretical knowledge, but when they start working with students uh, from a completely different culture outside of the United States, I saw them to, you know, it's very interesting to see how students interact because they would not have that, have that experience by just reading the theories and you know talking about it inside the classroom. So once they finish the course, they can say that they have actually worked with people from different cultures, is trying to solve a problem. So we make sure that there is a problem solving part in our assignments because um, then when you collaborate with people from different cultures and different perspectives, you broaden your horizon and you would otherwise may not have thought about it if you had done it by yourself. So springboarding from that concept of um, having an experience outside of the classroom and how that can influence the way that you think, um, I've spent a lot of time over the past few years thinking about how um, so much of our learning it emerges by chance. It's a conversation that you have with someone on a certain day or you go for a walk with someone and you see something through their eyes and it's a completely different um, setting. And nowhere has that been more apparent to me than in our university where we have so much talent and so many different perspectives, but often locked in different colleges or different departments or different campuses. So what started out as a sort of an experiment, uh, walking around with colleagues from different disciplines, going on hikes on the weekend, um, if I found that if I walked with a geologist, I would learn a completely different thing about the very same trail than if I walked with an environmental biologist or if I walked with um, a poet. Um, and so, um, you know, in these times when it's very hard sometimes to identify the funds, to build entire new spaces, to collide disciplines, um, things like the online types of collaborations that um, Perba is talking about, and the types of ways that we can leverage our environments around us um, became really intriguing to me. And so um, where I connected with the Office of Instructional Innovation was through a conversation with Brad Cohen um, where I was talking about, wouldn't it be great if we could develop experiences, like not everyone can walk around with each other all the time and learn all these things. So how can we begin to create opportunities for asynchronous learning? Um, we are recognizing that everybody's busy, but they might share some interests. And so um, I pitched an idea to, um, to the office um, and ended up with the most stellar uh, team to work with. And the project that we worked on was called Map Athens, where we basically took a, a base map of the area and then um, 
developed a template whereby different people with different types of experiences could create a sort of a lesson, something they might take their class to do, walking around or um, pointing out different places of interest in the campus and communities. And um, what I thought was going to sort of start out and maybe have three or four of these um, different perspectives has now grown to nine with about another <coughs> dozen in development. And we have everything from, um, from women's history tours to poetry strolls to um, ornithology walks to um, you know, really just, just about any discipline you can imagine. And some of these are coming from community partners. Some of these are being derived by students. We have um, a student in um, the School of Communication, the College of Communication, who's working on a social justice and, and art tour featuring passion works. Um, so there are all different types of examples of ways that we can demonstrate a sense of place around our different campuses and really begin to look at the real world as a classroom for learning. Break down our traditional um, boundaries of classroom walls with chairs that point in the same direction or even different directions and um, think about how people can experience um, their communities in different ways and really begin to get into all of the distinctiveness and, and the rich opportunities that we have for getting to know one another and getting to know the vast potential here um, for creativity and for problem solving. And so um, I really could never have, have accomplished this all by myself. It was, a, it was an idea and there were very many um, collaborators and content producers that then sort of sparked on this idea and would present different ways of accomplishing this. And this has now been leveraged in a couple of different classes um, whereby students have had a class project where they, they designed their own walk around the campus or around the community. Um, and some of them have turned into driving tours, they've spanned regionally, so it's been, it's been a really great experience to think about how um, place-based learning and things that happen in real world settings outside of the classroom can become not only a part of our learning experience here at Ohio University, but can be a way of connecting with our communities and um, looking for new ways of co-creating knowledge. Um, for me, in reference to the experiential learning in the class I talked about and other classes, there are certainly activities, writing activities, um, whether it be essays or speeches that they're writing, those are actually experiential learning, but that's kind of what we would expect. To me, um, uh, for the assignment that I talked about where they're writing political speeches, and where is this speech going to be delivered? Yeah, there's a significant difference in delivering it in uh, Baker University um, Auditorium than the steps of the courthouse where previous presidents have uh, uh, orated and shared their, uh, their thoughts and their speeches. And so encouraging students to look uh, more critically at um, where this event may happen in which this rhetoric is going to be shared, um, the history behind it, the significance, looking at it from a security perspective, looking at it from the historical significance that other world leaders have um, delivered presentations from these steps. Um, to me, that's kind of a secondary area, but more important than the actual speech writing skill. Um, and that's something you can't really duplicate from a textbook because that comes from the mind of the student and their understanding of the history of place. Um, and you want to obviously encourage them to articulate that in their writing and in their discussion and their explanation for this speech that they have written for a particular audience. Um, so understanding those aspects are important to and fundamental to the actual assignment. And so there's a lot more time spent there in encouraging students to explore those connections mm -hmm. than there are the actual um, five minute speech that they may be writing for a sci an assignment that's graded. So um, getting back to the question about the definition of experiential learning and, or how we define it, I think for, for me, what I, what I feel like a real experiential learning experiences are for students is when it really demands some personal growth mm -hmm. um, and that it's not just about the content and I, I, I believe that it is very important to not only do experiential learning like the, the mm -hmm. study of the theory and, and, and the sort of uh, classical definitions of things is important too but the experiential learning part is when it challenges 
a student or, or a professor to, um, <coughs> to think about uh, their own role and who they are and, um, and how this new knowledge is shaping who they are, what they're becoming, and what their career is going to be. Um, so like as a very simple example, I go back to early in my career when I wor was working with high school students um, in, that some of them were from inner city Baltimore and I would take them out um, to do environmental science projects and um, go on camping trips. And one of them told me in a camping trip in West Virginia that um, he had never seen the stars before. Um, mm -hmm. We were camping out under the stars, right? And, um, and he was 16 years old. And he had never seen the stars before because he'd grown up in a place with so much light pollution that um, it just had never been something that he'd taken the time to find a dark enough spot to look up at the sky. Um, and imagine, and then the conversations that followed after that about um, you know, how we view the world and what our place is in this world, I mean, that was a pretty dramatic change for this particular student who, you know, the next summer I would find just wading into every pond that he could to catch frogs with his pants rolled up, you know. Um, and so, I, you know, it really had a profound impact. And um, so that's just one example, but um, it's, it's one that sort of demonstrates that the, the personal um, growth that happens when you have an experiential learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. so it's interesting. Some of my students haven't seen someone like me before. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's in a broader sense mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. very um, telling mm -hmm. why this is more important. Right. In terms of your question about um, a definition, I did not learn much of the vocabulary around um, the civil rights tour and the civil rights class until I started hanging out with Jerry and said, oh, this is a thing. I thought I was just going from maybe instinct or muscle memory as an old newspaper reporter. Uh, you know, you get out of the newsroom, you go listen to people, you experience things. And being from the deep south myself and having been to all of these places where I take my students, um, my research is in the area of civil rights, history, and journalism. And so I've been in all of these archives and, and all of these states going, wow, my students really need to see this place. So high impact to me was um, what I was going for. That's really exciting. Thank you, guys. Some of the takeaways I heard from you were that it really helps increase cultural competency, uh, allows for increased access for interdisciplinary learning and personal growth and transformational change. And, and helping us connect with one another, which I think is really at the crux of strengthening civil democracy, as well as how we learn, not just while we're in a university setting, but throughout our lives. Uh, so kind of going off of that, what are some of the you know, essential challenges and lessons learned that you have experienced that could be helpful for others, both in starting, implementing, and evaluating your experiential learning? Well, um, I think um, one of the things that, um, you know, I can only talk from my experience, but I'm challenging a couple of things. You know, there's time difference um, and all that stuff and the technology issue. We, have, we don't want to use technology in a way that we are imposing on a different culture. So that's why this conversation with our partner institution is so important to figure out what they are capable of. A simple thing as internet connection, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the, what the student competency is, and also language competency, um, that, that is very important. So that's why we do not grade their assignments. Their assignments are graded by their professors, but they our students in both locations do the assignments at the same time, you know, collaboratively. Um, Another thing that um, I think the most important part of this um, COIL um, project within our classroom is that to sensitize our students before they start working with students from a different uh, you know, uh, culture is to what are the norms and uh, uh, so we create what is do's and don'ts 
and that do's and don'ts are co-created by the uh, two professors or instructors um, that uh, what is acceptable behavior and not and what could be offensive to uh, students of um, you know faculty of a different culture um, so that is a tremendous onus on that and there's Don sitting there who did a um, faculty learning community on uh, you know competence uh, I took that course and actually they wrote a book out of it and one of the chapters uh, we use when we train other faculty in um, how to start pointing, because these are the things that we have to take into account, because we are bringing in students from a different culture, not only students, faculty from a different culture within our class, classroom settings. So it's important that there is um, respect and decorum created, so mm -hmm. it's very, so that's why we, we are very conscious of um, sensitizing our students at the beginning of the semester by talking about whichever country uh, students we are going to work with um, about their you know cultural mores and beliefs and norms and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Other challenges, lessons learned? Yeah, sure. It's a challenge having a rolling classroom with 30 students on it, I figured out. Um, but uh, the big thing for me was relying on OGO, domestic programs. They handled a lot of the logistics for me um, because my area of expertise is not leading a tour, right? It's, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor and a, and a scholar. So, so that was a, a major learning curve. Lessons learned, um, the stuff we're dealing with is really rough. And um, I think that I could be desensitized by having studied it for so long. And so much of this content is just brand new to these students when we're talking about um, the deaths of civil rights workers um, on the side of the road in rural Mississippi. And so time to debrief and, and work on um, some of those issues. And these are special kids choosing to have their spring break on a civil rights tour. So they're already in a place where they're ready for this information. Um, but to work with them maybe each evening as, uh, for a debrief um, was particularly helpful. And we're in our third year of doing this, so we're getting better, I think. For me, one of the bigger challenges is that because um, you're not necessarily teaching concepts, you're actually teaching people. And so when they are engaging in these activities and these experiences, um, and the way that they talk about them really reveals an understanding of some of those basic concepts and what you may assume that they already know. And that's a little bit different, I think, in providing constructive criticism because you can say, well, you're, this definition isn't quite right. But when it is personalized and they're using their understanding of the definition, it takes, I think, a little bit more finesse to say, you know, this is, this is a well-written essay, but the concept you say you're using and the way that you internalized it and interpreted it isn't quite correct, so let's talk about that. So I think that is one, providing constructive criticism, you have to be a little bit more sensitive. And then the other thing is it can be kind of serendipitous. For example, when I taught a capstone class where they focused on their home community, um, how their home community talked about themselves and how the public talks about that particular community. Then they focused on Athens and then where they want to live. And so they did the same thing. So they got three different similar assignments throughout the semester. Um, when they were talking about their home, co uh, home communities, it was kind of serendipitous because the major issue at that point in time was the reconfiguration here in Athens, the reconfiguration of our school system. Mm -hmm. That was a common theme. And so after about two weeks of people presenting their research, and it was basically they were saying the same thing, how do I kind of pull this together so we're not just saying ditto? <laughs> but it's also kind of revealing, I think, of where we were as a state and a region in reference to our home communities. And not planning that and having to rely on your impromptu skills to say, OK, how can we talk about this? Because you're all, we're all, we think we all agree regionally, education K through 12 is important, at least in these communities. How are the communities talking about it differently? What communities may be um, in, in enjoying some degree of success in tackling that problem? And you can't, as an instructor, plan for that. But kind of, kind of, it kind of emerges mm -hmm. from the stories that the students are telling. And I think that 
I, I agree, Jerry. I think that one of the most important things when you're thinking about working in an experiential learning um, mindset is that it's so important to meet people where they are. You know, so everyone may be um, having a different learning experience during your real world um, experiential learning. You may have designed something that you think is going to elucidate a particular concept or give someone a formative learning experience where they can put something together. Um, but each one of the students, um, community members, even, even yourself as a faculty member, will be um, experiencing that differently. And so that kind of uh, sensitivity and nuance, knowing how to basically, um, you know, be in the moment enough to, to detect the student that's having a really hard time mm -hmm. and, and, you know, have that intervention just in time, or mm -hmm. being able to sort of respond to a pattern that you didn't necessarily think would emerge, that's the, that's the sensitivity in it. And I think perhaps why um, some people might feel um, intimidated by it, but I think that we need to um, push through that discomfort because that's really the way that learning takes place anyways. It's just, you know, um, with, this, with this mindset always for um, scaling things up and, you know, a growth mentality. We're always thinking about how we can do the same thing but more. And with experiential learning, I think we do need to have more opportunities for those experiences to happen, but to also recognize that they, each one of those experiences has to be right-sized so that the individuals that are participating can each have a, you know, a distinctive and, and life-changing experience. Yeah, I think I agree. I mean, some of the biggest challenges are just that um, different individuals are, have different levels of preparation mm -hmm. for the experience that you might introduce and um, just, and especially working if, in the Buena Vista School, we do a lot of interdisciplinary work and um, we have students that are coming from very different backgrounds and um, so sort of their, their initial scaffolding of knowledge is, um, is going to be different by the individual, but it's also, you know, the emotional preparation and the personality type that's suited for different kinds of experiences that, um, you know, some people are just more prepared for it than others. And, um, and so that's why I think working in teams is always a good thing. Um, it really helps to, for people to sort of share that dynamic and mm -hmm. then they learn from each other more that way too. Um, so, yeah. That's like how the real world works. Right. <laughs> Great. So, I think that leads well. I know we have a little feedback because we have so many microphones, so I'll get one second. Um, it's further than that. I'm guessing that might be the issue. Or just one standard. Who knows? Who knows how technology works? But speaking of it, <laughs> um, what are some of the innovative ways that you've seen, some of you are actively using these kind of strategies to you know, bring the real world, so to speak, into formal learning environments, um, you know, and that we're all navigating how to do that with limited resources? So what are some strategies to you know, include our online student population or you know, four classes that won't fit on a bus? <laughs> How do you incorporate experience learning into the settings? Interesting, interesting. Well, I think the assignments that I work with, for the most part, um, are are in the classroom. But um, so much is available through technology that um, um, going on to uh, City Council's webpage and reading the minutes that have been posted gives um, some pretty interesting insight into that particular community. Reading articles written by that particular hometown newspaper, um, interviewing people um, uh, through email or even telephone calls encourages the students to really get different perspectives um, from, um, uh, from that particular place. It engages them in a community that um, that they might have just previously, you know, passed through or experienced without recognizing what their experiences are. And so I rely on that pretty extensively because of budget issues and although I'd love to go out um, to Wayne National Forest and kind of explore the areas where they have burned and talk about the politics and the, um, uh, the public dis discussion surrounding whether burning is good or is not good, um, 
and I've done that before, it's not practical, because um, it does rain here, as we've known for the past couple of weeks. <laughs> Sure to turn it on, yeah. So I think there are a lot of opportunities for um, for connecting people from different parts of the world into the classroom. I've I've, I've used that before to have people call in uh, through Skype or some other medium to tell their story from Australia or some other part of the world. Although the timing doesn't work out very well in that case, I've had someone not show up before because we didn't realize it was really going to be three o'clock in the morning. Um, but um, but. I, there are also things that I've done, like having um, my students do debates in class where they they are required to consult with someone who has um, more experience with the topic that they're debating, and so they actually have to you know make a phone call and get their opinion on the the debate that they are are, are planning to uh, deliver in class. So I think there's there's a lot of simple ways to sort of introduce connections beyond um, the, the simple coursework. But I also think that there's so many opportunities on campus mm -hmm. um, and in this environment that don't cost very much. Um, so I'm going to go back to the, the land lab example um, that, you know, it's easy to go out and take a walk and to see things that are very nearby that don't cost very much. And we have... Uh, lots of uh, resources in the community in terms of um, and and just an, an amazing group of community members that are willing to engage um, with university uh, class activities that um, that I don't think it has to cost very much and that doesn't have to be a, an obstacle but mm -hmm. uh, Right. I mean, it's. I think it's about identifying common goals. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes with another um, instructor, sometimes uh, with a community partner, and then working together on that. And you can get a lot um, further when you're pulling together rather than apart. So, yeah, I think there are great opportunities here too. I'm going to throw a, a final question that I have before we get out to all of you. Um, what are some of the resources, whether it's from on campus or off campus, that you found to be most useful? The Office of Instructional Innovation, which has already been acknowledged. Academic <laughs> yeah. Innovation Accelerator. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And not, not just because Brad is sitting here. No. <laughs> we had to convince that we need that support in order for COIL to work, because technology is a tool with which we make it work. And, um, and really, um, the, you know, the person who works with us helps us to design um, that part. It, you know, how are we going to translate what we are thinking into something that is doable and that aligns with our objectives um, and outcomes? So, yes. That, that, that is what's yeah, that kind of teamwork, exactly, is, is so important because everybody has a different window. Our project has um, faculty, staff, and students from across all of the colleges, but most importantly, we have a team um, that includes uh, a text editor who can really just do so much with the content that we uh, begin to put together. We have a graphics editor, we have a web programmer, we have somebody who helps to share these ideas um, across the campus. And so without the support of um, an, an area on campus that is, is here to support innovation, we will be stuck <laughs> in, in the ways that we know how to do things. And so I really have appreciated being able to be partnered with a team of people that have all different skills and um, insights and abilities that, that I don't have. And I think it's, it's enabled a whole group of us from across the campus to do something we never would have been able to do without that team. And I would also add, um, add the global office because that's, um, that office uh, helped us to connect with the international partners because OU has, if you go to their website, it, we didn't even know that OU had so many partnerships with so many universities. So instead of faculty going to conferences and connecting with the faculty from different uh, geographical location, um, the global office um, has come forward to help us connect with already existing um, partners. So. 
I'll also put a plug in for the Voinovich School. We've been engaged with, um, with, the, with the community and, and different communities around the region for, for a long time before I even started and um, has, a, has a long history of, of relationships and, and doing experiential learning in all different kinds of disciplinary uh, contexts. So. I guess, to me, one of the greatest resources, because certainly um, with uh, Brad's initiatives, it provided some great funding to bring people together. But the conversations I've had with other folks that have stemmed from that has been one of the most, I think, mm -hmm. fundamental resources for me, because I talk with Perba, I talk with Amy, you know, I talk with Nancy and others, and I start thinking, well, I can do some of that too. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to worry about connecting, so it's just being willing to have a conversation with others and being willing to invite people out for coffee um, and not, uh, having, not feeling obligated to apologize that to, to infringe on the time, but just to feel comfortable enough to spend some time with each other and to talk has been one of the most valuable resources I've had as an instructor and a researcher too. Jerry, I feel like you just set that up as if we had talked about that ahead of time. So collaboratively learning from <laughs> your peers <laughs> uh, is perfect. So I would love to open the conversation up to all of you if you have questions, comments for our panelists here. And we'll test the, the quality of sound in this room to see if you can project your voice or if I get to run around for the microphone. I'm happy to do both, but let me know if you're having any difficulty here. Attend to that. Yes. I'm curious if any of you have uh, like some longer term assessment data that shows the impact that some of these experiences you're having on your students, and, and where are you telling people about those things? Or are you yet? Maybe you're not doing it. <laughs> that is our next goal. Okay. When? Yeah. <laughs> so, Three years, um, what the data we have from the regional faculty, because they have been doing it for three years quite successfully, uh, and interdisciplinary. Now that FOIL is going to be um, one of the flagship programs under the global office, we have huge plans um, to um, collect data pre and post, mm -hmm. and, uh, because th that's the whole point, um, whether the, the effort um, of so many people um, that we are putting in, there is an uh, outcome. We know the students talk about, so we do, um, apart from the regular evaluation, we do uh, uh, kind of our own evaluation of our students in order to find out what, um, what did they learn and how, did they, how it helped, what would they like to see more. And we do with our partner institutions, but that's informal so far. Um, so it has to be more structured and systematic. So um, I can answer that in a couple of, of different ways. So um, in my research career, the outdoor experiential learning piece, um, I see the test of that or the, the efficacy of that by where my students end up and sort of what sort of roles that they have and um, you know, what sort of, of career paths do they follow. And we've, um, I'm, I'm just, I'm so proud of where my students end up, um, you know, the, from, from a, a graduate student, a PhD student, um, to a master's student, to an undergraduate student. I've got, um, you know, a lot of data on that. And, and, um, and they have careers that are very meaningful to them, which I think is one of the biggest measures that we really need to be um, thinking about. Then I can put my med school hat on and say that over the 15 years that we had a very small pilot problem-based learning program that everybody said was, um, too expensive to scale up. It would be too difficult to scale up all of these different experiential learning opportunities. We had students that came in with some of the lowest um, sort of incoming uh, standardized test scores that fared just as well by the end of a two-year period of small group problem-based and experiential learning, um, case-based learning in the medical um, realm. And so based on that track record of experience, we have <coughs> scaled up and we've had to We've had to really be thoughtful about how to do that across almost 250 students now across three campuses. Um, but what we've done is we've employed those best practices and you know, um, we, we haven't been able to do as many small group learning experiences, but we've sort of figured out where the right sizing can be, um, how many uh, early clinical contact experiences or simulated patients that these um, doctors in training can interact with, how many team-based learning experiences 
um, can be pivotal for them. And then how do we assess that? And we've, we've adopted um, a sort of a reflective, formative portfolio um, type of experience for grading that. But in this case, we're talking about at a college level, we made the commitment to experiential learning and to doing that at a scale. And that took um, the energy and effort of all of the faculty and all of the staff across the group. So perhaps it's not a fair uh, comparison to what you might make to an individual instructor. But it is possible, and I think it's really pushing the needle for what we think about in terms of our professional education. Um, so I think that there are many different ways of, of assessing and evaluating, and, and the best way we can work together in an interdisciplinary fashion is by bringing to bear um, the people who have that type of um, educational training and interest into interdisciplinary teams. So if someone wants to start an experiential learning experience, you know, experiential learning um, activity, to maybe think about who you know in the College of Education, and if the answer to that is, I don't know anyone who might be interested in helping me develop an assessment, maybe then, sorry Brad, um, ask, ask Brad if he might be willing to, <coughs> to match make in that way and find someone who might be willing to work with you to think through that. Um, but it's really important, and I find that you know, the most um, sort of inspiring part of the whole experience um, for me, I feel like I'm experientially learning how, how to work um, across colleges and with, it, across communities. Um, it's really bouncing those ideas off of multiple people. Stop talking now. <laughs> I think this was turned off. You know how to turn it on? Okay. Um, to, to the assessment question, the Civil Rights Tour is a direct result of the assessment work that's happening in the journalism school. Our external accrediting agency um, of educators in journalism and mass communication in 2012 found us to be um, sorely lacking in our diversity standard. And we've implemented uh, quite a few initiatives as a result of that. But I think without that assessment um, portion, um, that showed our lack of diversity in terms of um, the people we employ and what we are teaching. I think as a direct result of that, that paved the way for this course to be created and implemented. And then just last Friday, we learned that we were reaccredited by our, our external body for another seven years. And I know as well in terms of assessment, evaluation, and data collection, there's going to be more activity uh, within the Center for Campus and Community Engagement, as well as the uh, once we've onboarded the new incoming director of undergraduate experiential learning, assessment, and data collection, really, so that we can tell the stories. And I'm sure that there'll be quite a significant partnership with UCM to build universal strategies for the storytelling of our success. And you hear again and again, close the loop, react to what you've learned. So this is a, maybe back it up a little bit, a little broader question. So why do you guys think that students come to a higher university? And, and maybe what, I mean, what do you think they come here to learn? Right, so it's experiential learning designed to help them prepare for careers, mm -hmm. or is experiential learning designed to broaden the scope of what they are learning about through their college career? I, Go ahead. Um, having met with um, the past several years incoming students as the Associate Director for Undergraduate Studies in comms and their families, one of the, you can't get beyond the beauty of this place. And so that is what people talk about. Our discipline, however, isn't training individuals, communication studies isn't, isn't training individuals to go into a particular career, but to become aware of themselves and who they are. And so we attract those students who really enjoy that, that ambiguity to a certain extent, and they're willing to find out who they are and what they're passionate about. Um, and that doesn't, <clears throat> maybe not every program can say that, but there is something about this place that attracts individuals. Um, in which, at least from my perspective, in which they feel comfortable learning about what they're passionate about. And so I think that's uh, what I see in here on a regular basis. And I would answer from the regional campus perspective. Um, a lot of the students who come to our regional campuses are first generation. They have no role models. 
Um, they are the ones um, who, for, for whom we act as a role model or mentor to make sure that they um, finish their degree and then go and serve in their communities. Mm -hmm. So for us, I would say both, uh, but more importantly, they come so that um, they, they want to come out of their whatever situation they are in. And I'm talking um, very general, but they, we have a large section of the population who are first generation and they, they, uh, they are place-based. Um, and um, so, so our job is not just to make sure that we have to finish the um, course and teaching whatever we need to, but make sure that this student go on to the next level next year and make sure they complete the degree uh, because those are the things, very fundamental things that we have to keep in mind. Um, so, if, if, you know, so it's, it's a learning experience for people like me who is not from this region or come from bigger schools because the onus is on us to, to make sure the student is ultimately successful, successfully complete their degree. So um, I can only speak from the regional campus perspective and I think that um, that place based wherever they are located is extremely crucial and um, they understand they're getting OU degree, um, not moving you know, where they are, um, whether they're Zanesville, Southern, Chillicothe or even now Dublin uh, campus, Pickerington, Lancaster, um, but, but you know, making sure that they, they complete the degree, ultimately. And obviously students come here for a wealth of different reasons. Some of them are very focused from day one on exactly what they're hoping to get here and they've identified this place as the place that can do that the best for them. Others come in relatively um, sort of open to figuring out what they want to do with their lives. But I would say what distinguishes the students across the board, whether we're talking about um, a really focused medical student or a graduate student, or whether it's um, a student that comes in with a general interest in, in the humanities um, or, or social sciences or sciences, it's, it, when a student comes to Ohio University, they are motivated. They're motivated to learn, and they've identified this as a place that is going to help them to better themselves so that they can go out into the world and make the world a better place. And that is the, that's the theme I hear again and again. And from our medical students who often have the opportunity to go anywhere they want to go, um, they comment time and again that when they come to the Ohio University campuses, our culture is very different. And that it feels much more welcoming and much more connected. And so sometimes, you know, as faculty, when we feel like we're fragmented across so many colleges, we don't have as much of a connection, connected identity as our students do when they come here. And so I think it's that, that combination of a, of a leadership as public service, of a, of a, you know, coming to a place to train where you feel that you can be yourself, your best self, and then go out and change the world. That's what I think is why students come here. From, from the graduates, I mostly work with graduate students. I mean, I, I, I see the same thing of people, students coming from all over the world and saying that, the, um, that we have a very open and welcoming uh, culture uh, and that we are, and then the kind of opportunities that we're providing like through the environmental studies program are to do um, hands-on interdisciplinary work um, that uh, really provides for a really high impact educational experience. Exactly, I, I mean, just one more point. As I hear time and again people say, I don't feel like a number here. So when they come to visit campus, when they, when they identify what's important to them, they feel like what they're going to do is going to be specific to them, you know, an, an individuated goal for learning, and that they're not just a number that's getting home through a program. And for uh, the Ohio University experiential learning element, we do a lot of recruiting in the J School, you might imagine, on look at all the student media opportunities. Right. You can be broadcasting on ESPN3, um, our football games, and, and any number of media outlets. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a, a huge recruiting tool for us. Mm -hmm. And that's not just journalism majors, right? There's a, a, opportunities are available for um, any majors across the university. Yeah. And just to kind of cap it off, I would encourage the response to be connecting all of these together. Because <laughs> I think they collectively right. really kind of provide a response to your question.
And they are backed up by data from NESI, part of the Carnegie application process. We were looking at the data, and it does consistently show that incoming students coming to a high university have a stronger interest in community engagement, including experiential learning, than compared to incoming students at our peer universities. So it's not just anecdotal. We've, we've got this. <laughs> so, other questions? That's a really wow. great question, and I think um, I, I think there are a lot of people um, at HCOM that I could pair you with to have a conversation about that. Um, we've been doing a lot with what we call um, learning laboratories, um, and so we've replaced our lecture-based format with um, sessions where we um, have expectations of what the students plan ahead in terms of their learning, and then everything that's happening in the classroom is guided by a team of faculty that have different um, areas of expertise, so pair your pharmacological expertise with someone's expertise um, in some other aspect of training um, in, within your program, and then have an interactive session where you take the students through questions and they can experience that process of creating knowledge um, and, and asking questions of people with different types of content expertise. And um, it can be just as efficient. It doesn't seem like it can be as talking to 300 people all at once, but we've, there are a lot of strategies for this. Other questions? I think we've got a couple more. We probably have time for one more question before we wrap it. Question. <coughs> Yes. So how, uh, you mentioned about team-based learning and it, 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 for, from a medical perspective, what, what do you think is sort of that ideal number where the, you get the biggest bang for your buck, but students still feel individualized in, in their learning approach? Specific to medical yeah. training? So, I mean, there are different philosophies about this. If you're talking about a small group conversation, there's a lot of research that suggests six to eight students at a time in a group, but you can have lots of groups within a particular course. Um, back to the, the content delivery system, it is true that some types of content are just best said. You know, there, there are, you know, there are just some, you know, some, some pieces of information that are important to share. We've elected to handle those through pre-recorded lectures that students can access asynchronously on their own time whenever they can best learn. There's not a necessity to bring everybody together to deliver that anymore because we have sophisticated means of doing that. And we've also tried to batch those types of information into smaller segments so everything doesn't have to be 50 minutes long. You know, we've, we've sort of, we were constrained by that by having these classrooms that we had to schedule. But, you know, um, my pre-records, some of them are 12 minutes long, some of them are, them are 23 minutes long. It's just however long it takes for me to get a certain concept across. But then the idea is that when students are in the classroom together and with the, the faculty, that something is actually, they're having an experience that is happening. There's an interaction that's going on that's catalyzing them to learn something in the space at that time. So you can break things, you can do break students into groups, into pairs. Um, there are a lot of different strategies for that, but it's just about uh, changing a little bit how you think about the time you spend in, in front of the students. That's very cool. I have a question. And we just have a couple more minutes, so maybe. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Does, does the audience have some good ideas, that yeah. things that you guys are doing um, in place-based or experiential learning that you'd like to share? Any other ideas? Yeah. I just want to share a comment. I worked on Chancellor Lane at the last institution, and I just helped school to console it. And one of my takeaways was that every student has a different level of knowledge and skill set that they can bring to the table. So I think that there is a possibility to <laughs> Don't go away. <laughs> I, I was just going to echo that and say I think 
that's a really good point, and I always feel awkward talking about the medical school idea because you know it does have a lot of moving parts. But one thing I think everyone can do in their classes is just pick one one classroom, you know, activity, one event where um, you suggest the students do something different, like you know, um, have have the class somewhere else, or you know, go for a walk, or do something. And a lot of people are already doing that, um, but just suggesting that that bringing a different experience in and sharing that can also be really valuable. Well, with that, I think we will go ahead and draw it to a close. I want to thank Sarah and Nancy, Amy, Jerry, and Herba for being here today. And thank you all very much. I look forward to